Hello, welcome, and thank you, everyone, for being here. I trust uh, you're having a good day. Uh, my name is Simonetta Moro, and I am the director of the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts, a low residency PhD program in art, philosophy, and aesthetics based in Portland, Maine, in the United States. And I have the distinct pleasure to introduce our speakers today uh, for the spring panel discussion on Maori culture with two exceptional guests, Piri Piwaretini and Simon Liming. I would also like to welcome to this discussion, Professor George Smith, the founder and president of IDSVA. And, uh, and also I would like to thank Angela Lynn Dunlop for her technical assistance today. We're here because we think that IDSVA is a learning site of enabling art and thinking practices centered on difference and a critique of Western metaphysics which in our view has the potential to act as a catalyst to produce change. IDSVA is aimed to change the way we think, to change the way we see the life world and the way we see one another. The change we are working toward as a shared communal aspiration stands as IDSVA's vision of the possible. So it is all the more fitting that, uh, to dedicate this session to an introduction to Maori culture, uh, which, um, with a particular emphasis on the role of language, te reo Maori, in shaping and nurturing the native culture of Atea, Aotearoa, New Zealand. My apologies. Grazie, grazie. I will start by uh, briefly introducing Simon Liming, followed by a few remarks by Professor Smith. Uh, then Simon will speak for about 15 minutes, after which I'll introduce Piri Piwaratini, who will talk for about 45 minutes. Uh, there will be time for Q&A at the end of the session, but please feel free to enter your questions while the presentation is in progress. You will find a Q&A button at the uh, bottom of your screen. Uh, if you do so, uh, the speakers may address them as, you, as they talk. So thank you for your participation. Uh, I just want to say this presentation is recorded and will be made available in our Vimeo and YouTube channels. So um, here we are, Simon Liming is a fifth generation New Zealander living in Wellington. He has practiced law for 40 years in the US and Aotearoa, New Zealand, and served as New Zealand's honorary consul to the New England States for 20 years. Uh, importantly for us here, Simon was a board member of the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts in Portland, Maine, uh, between 2006 and 2014. So it's a very uh, great pleasure to welcome you back in our fold, Simon. Um, uh, besides that, he has also been on the board of numerous civic and charitable institutions. In 2013, he was made a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit, for his contributions to uh, New Zealand and US relations. Simon has a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature from Boston University and the University of Wales and a Doctor of Laws from Suffolk Law School in Boston. He's currently working towards a BA in Maori Art and Design at Massey University, Aotearoa, New Zealand. He has been a wood carver for over two decades and has been tutored by established Maori carvers. He sits as a trustee on two regional Maori trusts and is consulting to an uh, iwi, or Maori tribe, on claims issues relating to the Treaty of Waitangi. Uh, there's more to say, but it is my pleasure now to pass the microphone to Professor George Smith, who will make a few remarks of his own. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. That was a wonderful introduction to my dear friend, Simon Leeming, whom I've known since boyhood and whom I've admired since the day I met him. But I just want to uh, mention as we get going here that uh, maybe now 40 years ago, 35 years ago, Simon and I uh, took a long walk on, a, on an island off the coast of Maine in the North Atlantic and uh, sat on a beach for an hour or two in the dark talking about how wonderful it might be if one day we could somehow or other be uh, instrumental in bringing uh, our own lives together 
with the culture of New Zealand in such a way that it would inform the world of the promise of the future of the kind that we were actually dreaming on the, of as we were as young men gazing at those stars. So here we are now in this moment, realizing that dream that I invite everyone to uh, join in on as we think about how the future of the world might in fact uh, find some promise uh, in the wisdom of the kind that we will hear from Purpi and others. Thanks, Simonetta and Simon, I welcome you to jump in. Well, firstly, I'd like to uh, welcome our guests and visitors uh, to our session. We're very much appreciative of everybody who's joined and in the future that it'll be available for for uh, being recorded, so also be available in the future. Um, I'd like to thank the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts, a great groundbreaking uh, institution which has cut a great sort of change in the world of of artists and curators of museums and and, and others it's done a marvelous marvelous job and george smith my dear friend who who uh, brought uh, who we have been friends as he pointed out for a long time was such instrumental in all of that and Simonetta thank you very much for for putting this together and Al and others on on the on the staff uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today and is somewhat a realization of a dream and hearing those kind remarks Simonetta from you and George from you I, I, I almost feel I'm sort of watching my own funeral so uh, thank you mm -hmm. um, the uh, I'd like to set the stage, set what we call the pai pai, which is the the stage upon which Piripi will talk. And for those who are very familiar with New Zealand and its history, uh, I, I ask for some forgiveness because I'm going to go through some of that in, in a brief way because I think it's important to bring what's happened in New Zealand up to today so that then Piripi can take that and move it forward. So, So we start with Godwana land back 4.6 billion years ago when when the earth itself was being formed and that was the great southern continent which included Antarctica and Australia and New Zealand and New Guinea and other other places and and in 83 million years ago what is now known as Zealandia broke away from that great continent and Zealandia is in fact the eighth continent, 85% of it is underwater and the 15% which is above water is New Zealand itself. Uh, the dinosaurs, huge eagles and primitive trees and birds and reptiles uh, thrived in, in early New Zealand, Aotearoa, New Zealand. The dinosaurs were wiped out uh, approximately 63 million years ago. There's all, there is a tuatara in New Zealand, which is a lizard which, which harks back to the age of, of dinosaurs. It has a third pineal eye. Um, and New Zealand had no predators. It was birds. The only mammals were bats and sea lions and seals and other, other coastal creatures. Um, and a thousand years ago, the great Polynesian traveler, navigator, seafarer, Coupe came to New Zealand with, with his wife. And as he came, he saw this stretch of land with a bank of clouds all above it, which his wife named Aotearoa, the land of the long white cloud. And, and when anybody who's coming to New Zealand flies in, it's usually early in the morning, and as you look out the airplane window, you can see the same scene that Coupe would have seen back in the day um, with the long banks of clouds stretching above our, our, our beautiful land. Uh, in 1642, Abel Tasman of the Dutch East India Company um, rediscovered New Zealand, but in the interim, seven Walker, seven canoes had come to New Zealand 
and the Maori people began to populate the country all up and down. And today, Maori can each can link their ancestry back to one or more of those those canoes. And when Abel Tasman came, he didn't actually set upon the land, but um, he when when he came, local Maori uh, believed that he was coming to to take their agricultural. The, the, he came to a place where there was a lot of agriculture going along, and Maori uh, believed that he was coming to to steal that. And uh, consequently, four of his crew were killed, and the place became known as Murderous Bay. Uh, 142 years later, the great James Cook, Captain Cook, uh, rediscovered New Zealand for the third time, and. Uh, Again, he his his relationship with with Maori was a little bit strained. There were some deaths, uh, but he had with him Tupaya, who who was from Tahiti, who was a translator, and and Cook um, has been called uh, the the greatest traveler, further than any man has gone before him. But we would dispute that because we think that Coupe actually should hold that title. New Zealand was the last largest landmass to be populated by people. And after James Cook, sealers and whalers, because it was a great time of, of whaling um, from North America, from Britain, from other places, uh, came to New Zealand. And there are also escaped convicts from Australia and many other uh, un unwelcome unwelcome sort of people who created havoc. There was a town called Kororareka, which is now called Russell, which had been described as the Gomorrah, the surge, the scourge of the South Pacific with taverns and fighting and prostitutes and drunkenness and, and, and all sorts of, you know, horrible stuff, which triggered a couple of things. One was missionaries had come to New Zealand in 1815 and local Maori um, were very uh, upset with what was going on with uh, some of the so-called immigrants to New Zealand. And so in 1835, declared the tribes, most of the tribes declared what's called the Declaration of Independence, where Maori declared that it retained and has sovereign power over New Zealand. And five years later, the formative document of the New Zealand Constitution, the um, Declaration, uh, the, sorry, the Treaty of Waitangi was formed between the British Crown and New Zealand Maori. And um, it was translated from the English to Maori, which, which created a lot of linguistic and interpretation issues, including the fact that, that the Crown believed it had sovereign rights over New Zealand, whereas Maori understood that the Crown had the right to essentially to govern its people, but that Maori retained their sovereign rights, their indigenous, and all that they had known before that. So that, um, so that, uh, Following the treaty, there were land wars between Maori and the Crown. Uh, there was land was taken from Maori, um, and uh, things that were intended from the treaty didn't happen. And in fact, in 1846, one of the courts declared that the treaty itself was a nothing, a nullity, and it wasn't until. 1975 that the British, the New Zealand Parliament uh, enacted what's called the Treaty of Waitangi Act, which finally recognized and enshrined in New Zealand law the Treaty of Waitangi. And since that time, um, there has been, uh, uh, I would say, a steady move towards recognizing the rights that had been taken and 
they're restoring some of the land. There was there have been reparations. Um, there's been a great renaissance of of the Maori language and Maori uh, arts and customs and performance. And although not perfect, when I was growing up, we used to say that New Zealand had the best relationship between its indigenous people and its colonizers. That turns out not to have been true, but we are moving towards that. And so it's with great optimism that I'm here today because we, we New Zealand was called the social laboratory of the world and it still now uh, has the opportunity through our relationship between Maori and non-Maori to, to move that forward. Uh, personally, um, I'm called, I'm Pākehā, I'm not Maori. Um, and where I grew up was basically a, a non-Maori area, although my father, my uncle and others were, were quite heavily involved uh, with 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 Maori, uh, the common bond, quite frankly, in New Zealand is rugby. And uh, t t this afternoon, I'm going to a rugby match between between Wellington and 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 the Waikato, um, which is uh, which is the, the 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 great religion in some ways of New Zealand. Um, the my real introduction or or enshrining into friendship and Maori culture began when I was the honorary consul and in 2001 we put on a hangi which is a traditional way of cooking food in the ground we had rugby games and we had all other stuff and for 18 years we 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 had a hangi every um ironically uh the uh, on the um week, Columbus Day weekend and um uh, from that, the first time the Kahurangi Māori Dance Theatre came and because of some issues with their vehicle, um, ended up staying with us two weeks and great bonds were, were then formed. Uh, I started to carve because I was taught by, by one of the carvers of the group of eight who came. Um, we're still, um, I'm, I'm on the trust for the Kahurangi Māori Dance Theatre and over the years, we had other, we had um, uh, Tumanuko um, and London Haka and other groups come and perform. And one year we had well over 800 people at our hangi. And we became really the center or, or the, the outpost of Maori in the US and great friendships were formed. Um, Myself, with John Royal, and Atta Papa, and Albie McElroy, and Jesse McRae, and Isaac Teokata, and Tiaka Kahi, Dino Rosta, many others. And every year we'd all sort of congregate together. And um, my one regret of leaving, or one of my regrets of leaving the United States back to my native New Zealand with my wife uh, a year and a half ago is that we had to stop those, those hangis. But connections is what happened and we um through through our great friend wallace Wiremu totoa um we connected we were i was connected with Pirapi waratini who is our next speaker who will take the pipe i take the platform and um is a wonderful uh, will give a, a wonderful address that I'm looking forward to. And there we are um, up at his uh, Tokumaru Bay up on the east coast of, of New Zealand, which has been devastated lately by by two cyclones and, and Pirapi and his family and others have been battling the, the, the elements to get roads fixed and transport uh, and 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 all of the necessaries for for village life to come back together but without further ado um, I'd like to just turn it back over to Simonetta who will introduce my great friend Peter P thank you thank you Simon thank you very much
It was a wonderful introduction. Um, yeah, it is my great pleasure to introduce Piri Pivaretini. I would like to also apologize in advance for my likely mispronunciation of Maori words. I'll do my best. Um, mm -hmm. Perfecto. <laughs> Piripi belongs to the uh, Waikato Maniapoto Tribal Confederation. He is a certified translator with the Te Taura Wiri I Te Reo Maori, Maori Language Commission of Aotearoa New Zealand, whose translation work ranges from complex legal documentation and Pushkin's poetry in Yambing Tetramata to several movie scripts. With over 40 years of experience teaching Te Reo, he is an English Maori major with a Bachelor of Arts from Waikato University. Piripi is a poet, a writer, and a musical composer, and amongst other things, was the former Wellington chair of uh, Ga Puna Waihanga, uh, New Zealand Maori artists and writers. As an actor, he knows through experience the importance of scripting, and in particular, the importance of integrity when incorporating te reo Maori and tikanga, which means customs. Piripi is a huge advocate for excellence in te reo mentoring uh, industry icons, such as Cliff Curtis, Jennifer Te Ataimira Award, Leland, Michael Hurst, and Te Muera Morrison, among others. Piripi was the inaugural Kaifakahere Maori advisor to parliamentary service and the office of the clerk. He and his wife, Angela, own their own business, teaching accelerated Tereo specializing in the corporate marketplace. And in addition, they deliver to um, Fanao Maori and Marae forums via the social enterprise arm of their business with an aim to repopulate the Pepe, the traditional speaker's platform. I would like to conclude my brief introduction with an excerpt from a letter to my 10 year old self uh, that uh, Piripi sent me ahead of time. Just a brief excerpt. He says, the growth will be that you realize wealth is actually found in how you think, not what you have. What you have is a byproduct of how you think. And you'll begin to see that relationships and people is where the real wealth can be found. It's nice to have nice things because I know you know what lack looks like. But believe me, Things can change like the wind. What's cool will run out of coolness. But people and relationship are eternal. Which reminds me, the fanau you love, get with them whenever you can. They won't always be there. There are things you do that will change the lives of lots and lots of people in Aotearoa and around the world. The impact and change will come out of you being Maori, truly Maori. Right now, you won't really understand what mana is all about, but you will learn and find how that works for you and those whose lives you touch. Thank you, Piripi. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. So my name it sounds like Piddy, P-I-D-D-Y with a P-E-E -E at the end, Piddy P. So my name is Piripi Kingi Waretini. Should start there. So Piripi, I'm named after my, my deceased father. Um, Kingi is my deceased uncle. And Waretini, our family name, actually means to serve, to serve many, many numbers. So I hope to live up to that. Um, when I was a, a, a very young, young boy, really, my grandfather would teach me about speaking publicly you know, on these pipe on these speakers' platforms like we have now. And he always said to me a couple of things. The first thing out of my mouth needs to be ko ta koto mo kai tene e mihi atuana te koto. I am your servant and I greet you. That's it. Now, uh, I, I fought against that. Uh, my ego wouldn't, wouldn't allow that as a young person, but I'd like to start with that, the words of my uh, grandfather. Mm. So the first, uh, just to back up on that bio, I just want to mihi, which is to greet and to recognize George, Matua George, we, we use Matua as a term of, uh, of respect and regard, and Fire Amy, 
we always believe in Teo Māori that mana tāne and mana wahine, the authority of men and women, rests together. And we're speaking about a meeting house, a traditional meeting house. And if you look at the shape of it, you'll see that it comes together like that. Mana tāne, mana wahine, male authority, female authority. And they come together in absolute equity. Uh, we also believe that comes from our belief system around the ecosystem where the male entity for us is the sky father and the female entity is the earth mother. They sit together in perfect harmony and we're in the middle as they are celestial templates for our terrestrial existence. And we're talking about how that works today. So yes, uh, a big mihi ati, a big greeting of respect to George and to uh, Amy, Kaya Amy, Matua George, and also to uh, Sister Simoneta, uh, Simoneta. To the, and to you all of the ID, BSA, Fano and community and the wider listening audience, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tata kato. So I'm really quite, quite humbled listening to the introductions and such of everyone and to be amidst you all, so kia ora rau. I'll do my best. I promise my wife I'll do my best. There we go. So in a brief bio of my own catch-up, we had a uh, talk earlier on that you might catch and you can get more of the detail. But essentially, when I look at it, um, I grew up as an Indigenous person in rural 60s New Zealand, colonised, urbanised, traumatised, isolated, disconnected. And then with time, re indigenized and reconnected. So this will be my talk today. We call it Te Wahi Ngaro, Off the Cuff, The Lost Part. And uh, a former mentor of mine, Wareto, when I was a young man at university, he said, Ofa Te Kafa, Off the Cuff, Ofa Te Kafa. So he was a champion of Māori transliteration. So there you go, Off the Te Kafa. I'll be also speaking about Fai Kōrero, The Art of Oratory so that we can share an experiential journey of language and culture uh, to this, to, so that you can feel the walk together with the, uh, actually I'll take this off, sorry, I don't need to hear myself, um, and the importance of language to culture. So if we could just please have the first image, now oh, and put that up for people to see. So this is our meeting house, uh, and you can see the shape of it like that. There's a central part at the top, which is our ancestral head, and the left and right, they're about the male and female entities right there that hold that house together. You've got a pillar, central pillar that reaches up, and then it goes up further. So we see the creator above, the head of the creator comes down to the head of the ancestors, and then comes down to the speaker who sits on this pipe pie or this platform of speakers there within the mantle and the protection of the house. So um, in terms of that fight portal and, and what you see, we'll be, we'll be looking today at the interior, which tells us all the story. So if we can have a shot of the interior, please, Al. So in the interior, you see there, there are, that, that's our house. It's our house of learning. That's where we sleep. That's where you know, our mums, 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 mum, and dad, 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 dad slept in there 150 years going back. So it's really comfortable. Um, over time, of course, it moved into from, say, earthen floors, and now we've got carpets and things like that, and heaters, and they put in uh, alarms for fires and such in the modern context. But essentially, that whole house is as it was when it was first created back in 1883. Yeah, so there it is there. So it tells all the stories. There are 24 of those carved pillars that go to the left and right as a visual institution you'll appreciate the artwork that's gone into that and they work in tears. They show you about your ancestry, about how you how you uh, might like to conduct your life. Above, as you look up high, it gets to the more uh, metaphysical side of the story. The central post tells the story, but I'm going to talk about the two figures. You can't really quite see it, but in the front, there's a woman there. Her name is Mahi Narani. I'll talk about her. And then there's one right at the back, Tūrongo. She's a female matriarch and Tūrongo at the back is the patriarch of our, of our tribe. So to take us into the house, um, I'd just like to share an incantation about moving into new spaces together. As you're walking into new spaces, you might be doing a presentation, you might have a, 
you might have an exhibition on and, and it's the first time that you're either delivering or going into it. So this one here is about paying out. The back here, you can see there's a, a mere, a mere ponome. So the mere ponome is, is what we use when we when we give us our talk. So and just briefly do an incantation here as we go into the house. Uh, this inc incantation was um, taught to me by one of our Manya Puto elders. My tribe is Manya Puto. We're speaking about him as our as our ancestor in around 1992. And uh, I was presenting on behalf of the Te Kura Toi Whakari or the New Zealand drama school where I was teaching at the time. And we went to a meeting of all the New Zealand Māori artists and writers at a place called Ōmaka Marae in the Tauihu in the top of the North Island. And uh, after my talk, he came back and he said to me, oh, you might like to learn this in this, uh, this call It reminds me of my uncle, uh, Mac. He was an ex-World uh, War II veteran. Very, very humble man and uh, Mac Wadetini, Makarini. And when he came back from the war, it was later that we found out that he was a champion boxer in there. And uh, I think it was about early 20s and I went to see him and asked him if uh, to teach me how to box because I like martial arts. And at the time, he said, how old are you, Ethel? And when I told him, he said, uh, you like golf? <laughs> At least you take, take whatever you will from there. Anyway, I think Uncle Johnny McDonald and Uncle Johnny Mac, we called him, have thought the same thing with my delivery. He thought this could be helped out. Um, it was quite a, an, an ordeal for me because it was the first time I was speaking in front of the Maori Queen. The Maori Queen, my gosh, it was night, the light was on. You could have, could have heard a pin drop. And I hadn't expected to talk. I'd handed over to my uncle and thought he would take care of that. But uh, he said, you do it, boy. And, and so I did it. So here's the incantation. Ona mate ka fa e taka tura e taka tura e taka nei e u kote po wini wini u kote po wano wano kote hau o ti ti fa ka mau ke ti na hau mi e hu e ai ti. So we're into the house. Not too clear. Just clear that. A way forward for us. So welcome. So with that. <clears throat> He learned that amongst the, uh, thank you for that uh, that picture there. Oh, that's awesome. Um, we had other luminaries of the time, other uncles, Uncle Three Adams, Uncle Hena, Kufangai. They were the leaders of our youth. So we were duplicating, duplicating, duplicating. Leadership leads science, you know. Duplicate, populate, just re -eminate. So as we move on, um, there's also a song I'd like to sing that one of our nannies had, and this is a song of hope and joining. Um, her name was Nani Tikuri Kran. She was a spokesperson, uh, sorry, she was a, a, a caller in Māori when we start out our, our ceremony. We have a woman who calls and joins all the spirits from the visitors' people to the people of the home people for the Māori Queen, and she was also a composer of many songs. And uh, when groups would come, they might sing their song, and she'd stand and sing with them, and then Oftentimes, sing verses I'd forgotten. So, as a young boy, I used to go and mow lawns and light fires for her, and I learned a few songs. So, this one is one of joining us together, connecting. It's sadness of loss, but it's also hope and, and future proofing. So, here we go. <laughs> E aroha nui nei e, tēnā rā ngā waka, hei te pau, hei ringa tapu, ki ahora te marino, ki hei mauri ora e, e kōkiri. Kia ora tātou. Uh, hmm. So, Matu Haimona, Simon, he spoke about kūpē, kūpē the first uh, discoverer of Aotearoa New Zealand there. So it was in 1907, talking the Suppression Act, that really hurt us as a people. We weren't able to practice our songs, our, our culture, our healing. 
and uh, it was a huge disruption. Now, there was a, an incantation that through all of that suppression has lasted all the way through to now. And it's an incantation that was used by Kupu to travel from our ancient homeland of Hawaii all the way to Aotearoa. And I just wanted to mention that now. Um, Papa Te Whaitiri. Papa Te Whaitiri. And uh, her Tupuna Tuko presented that. Now, it was, at, uh, was held in the Auckland Museum for many, many years. She went in to, to check them out and uh, she found they went looked out. So she just walked out with them. Look at that. And uh, over time, she asked me to translate that and I did. I'm not going to, to uh, intone that at the moment. I just wanted to mention that because it's lasted through all of the legal suppression. It might, have been, might as well have been the People's Suppression Act, right? The Conscious Suppression Act, and then it lasted through. I haven't actually asked Robin yet whether I can share it publicly, so I'm just being careful about that. So I want to talk about our, our uh, chief, our, our maker, Hōturoa, who is married to Whaka Ōtirangi. And if I could please, I'll just have a shot of the Imperial coming up again. Uh, thank you. So within those pillars, you have 24 of those pillars. And Hōturoa, our chief, and Whaka Ōtirangi, his wife, uh, one, two of those major pillars. So the Whaka Papa, as it comes down with the genealogy, is Hōturoa, Hōtuopi, Hōtumatapai, Motai, Uwe, Rakamama, Kākachi. And then it comes to Tūroma, and that's the figure right there. Now, Mato Haimona was gracious and generous, and he um, gifted this Merepaunamu to me. At the uh, 150th celebrations of our house, we uh, I named it Tūroma, and then took it into me, Tūroma, the ancestor. So that's that ancestral line there. Um, in 19, around the 1995 era, we were teaching, oh, we can take that picture off now, thank you. Uh, uh, Al, yeah. Mm. Around the 1995 period, I was um, back in Tekwiti, where I come from. I was actually um, working as a, at uh, Waikiri Prison as, as a manager. Mm. Anyway, um, we also had a carving a carving house in our town where we taught women as well, which is very unusual, very unusual We're crossing a lot of the different cultural uh, uh, growth spurts, if you can call it that. So this song here talks about uh, talks about the relationship between men and women. What it says is that really, that like Ranginui and Papatunuku, as they work together, so we do as young men and women, and old men and women, because they have all sorts of ages. But mm -hmm. the reason I wanted to share this is we've taken a modern context of song, expression, visual and otherwise, Bring into a modern context, and it also is uh, joins with a wider audience because the, the melody line was given to me and shared with me by my cousin Barry Taylor, who's a it's an ace guitarist, he's an axe man for you musicians. So, so that is I'm, gonna, I'm not too sure it's coming through on sound mm -hmm. so this is a James Taylor tune as I said so connecting with everyone out there and it's about male and female synergy love and respect for one another here we go I
So once again, it's about the synergy between men and women as one, and also the connection again to the IHOC, to our environment. So killed and I'd also like to say that for the people who are listening, if you have questions, just put them into the, into the chat, and I'll, uh, as I'm talking, I'll read that into our talk. So yeah, we have uh, that whakapapa line that I brought down into us as a people. So it went from 12 generations, and two the figure, the figure in the front of the house. So I also want to bring down the female line, which is from Pororangi, Ueroa, Tokoro Wahine, Romai Wahine Kahunganu, Kurukuranu, Rakai Hikuroa, Tu Purupuru, Rangi Tuehu, Tuaka, Tu Mahinarangi. And then from Turonga, these two figures in the house, Turonga the male, uh, Mahinarangi the female, one from the west coast, one from the east coast. Then we have Rediahu, then we have Maniapoto, which is my tribe. And that's a connection there through those generations. So uh, just as an aside, a brief personal aside, when my wife Angela and I got married, it wasn't Angela to Piripi, it was Turonga to Mahinarangi, as we celebrated that to, to recognize those bloodlines. So what I'd like to talk about is really in, in, in our talk today is around intention. The intention. What intention do we have? My intention today is to share this with you as a show and tell so you're walking in my feet. Well, it might be that self-indulgent. So that we're walking in the culture uh, rather than merely talking about the culture. Yeah, walking in the culture together. Mm. So the first part is the intention. And I would ask with you, your own intentions about what you do, why you're here, and the walk you take. And then there's the connection, take two honotama, so that we walk together. And we also, as we walk in our feet together, we tell our stories together. We tell our stories, ancestral stories, uh, modern stories, connection stories like Matwe George and Haimona sitting there as young men staring into the stars on that beach. And here we are, te puwawai tango te whakaaro, when you have the fruition of that spark, that thought, that he na tori, just goes like that. And also about health, health and well-being, the two honotanga, because as we walk together, for us, we, we see the creation where Mother Earth and the heavens were separated, so there becomes a period of chaos, and then we just look to reconnecting to the environment as we live. And in many of our lives, especially and particularly here in Aotearoa, as Matu Haimun pointed out, we had a lot of chaos or reconstructing chaos and disharmony through decolonization, colonization and decolonization. So again, with the intention, the expression, the connection, health and then well-being, to encourage the well-being through what we call oranga, future proofing for our kids, 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 so that we encourage the expression of your story, your intention, your message, your connections as we walk in your feet together. So that creates an immutable cycle of internal legacies through your expression through visual arts. There we go. Yeah. Um, the patterns of the carvings. So in terms of some of the patterns of the carvings, there's some that go like this. They look like chevrons on a on a corporal or well, on a, in, in an army, they, they're called chevrons, so they're shaped like this. So we call them kaukau. And kaukau are uh, armpits. And you think, well, do Māori have an armpit fetish? No. What they mean is that 
this Karl Karl paper signifies leadership and also signifies um, high levels of nobility. So the children were conceived on these mats that had these, of high birth, were conceived on these mats, these fine woven mats that had these patterns. Before the warriors went into the battle, they would walk over these mats. So the Karl Karl pattern is really one of being prepared. As you go through your own work, as you express and you do your own expressions, you need to be prepared. So what you'll do when you do that is you make sure that you're in the, in the zone, in the lane. Right? Before talking today, I actually changed my whole talk and delivery as I spoke with my wife last night and early this morning and, and prepared for that. So that's called Kao Kao. So when we when we um, uh, form haka, which is a posture dance, we're like this. Now you see that there, and you're showing your armpit, which is bring your A game. We're ready to engage. Right? So that's what the Kao Kao pattern is. There's another one that has Wahaurua Kōpito, which looks like this inside the house. And what that is, is the mouth in the uh, womb of the umbilical cord. Once again, if you're not sure, if you're from another cult, you might think, well, now Māori have got not only an armpit fetish, now they've got a belly button fetish. But what that really is, is a connection to home. When our children are born, we take the afterbirth and we put it into the land. It's called whenua. And the afterbirth is called whenua. So it's got a double connection. From there, when you go wherever you go in the world, you come back to that whenua. Recently, um, back in our area of Whaimaro, my kids took all of the afterbirths of all of the mokos and we had a ceremony there and buried them. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there. I was locked in through, the, through all the devastation we had here. So one of my uh, relatives took that ceremony. So when we see that, that's connections to home. I want you to think of when you're isolated, you might be in an urban area. You might be far, far from your beloved kids and kin, and you just pick up the phone, or now you can, teach, you can go on, you know, FaceTime or whatever. That that connectivity. Why how do I call people? The other thing we might have is what we see, Roy Matotoro, which is the tears of the albatross, and they come down like little dots like this. And that's the story about Pauranga who, who actually um, sent a, uh, the first trans-Pacific crossing with these two magical birds, Halomanuku, Halomarangi, staying close to the earth, staying close to the, to the heavens. Right? And uh, there was a, uh, but there was a, a first young, young learner from IDSVA who went over to take the Kumara to Aotearoa. And he was told, look after these birds. They're magical birds. Eh? They're very, very special birds. Look after them. But he didn't. And then when he sent them back, they, they, were, they were a bit battered up and they got hit up by Tunui Tika, which is a, a denizen and things like that. And they got bashed about. So when they went home, they were very sad and boo hoo hoo to, to the priest who then sent a, uh, a charm, and, uh, which made the kumara feel just grown beautifully and, and Eden, if you like it, Aotearoa. But then they were uncertain by bugs and other things, and that made you have to work harder to make them grow. So that really is all about, is all about due diligence and attention and care and love and empathy and gratitude. So that was the lesson that every time you look at these, they tell you stories about, about your behavior. There's others that talk about hoitama, like we look like stairways on a pipeline that, you know, that you get through 101, 102, 103. So each of these really is an organic uh, messenger of how we work as a, as a people. Yeah, so, so thank you for that question. There, uh, there's another one called Puta Puta Fetu, all the stars in the heavens. And the Puta Puta Fetu stars, they are about, um, they look like little, mm, almost little hexagons, but they're little and there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots, and lots of them. So they're about, they're about um, growth, population, regeneration, our kids, 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 kids. And the, the final one I'd like to talk about is, is um, Pātiki. Pātiki is a is a is a um, flounder. Pātiki. Now we've got uh, a constellation up there in the heavens in the Milky Way called the Pātiki, and when at a certain time of year it's perpendicular or it's not in in line with the Milky Way, but then as the seasons change, it 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 becomes parallel. 
Right. And for us, we know that that's a good time of harvesting. I used to go, early, uh, when I was a boy, I used to go uh, spearing with my older brother for these pātiki. And we had an old two in a lamp and, and a spear, but my job was to hold the sack. I just flapped my arm, he put it in, and then you know, get all these different different flounder going in, and then he gave me a shot at it. Well, I couldn't, you know, I've been waiting for ages. I was just a little boy, just floating in the water. So I saw it, and I saw the, the flounder, and I excitedly went to plug it, and I missed because I went from the air into the water. And as you move from what we call Tafiri Matea, and you move into a different medium of Tangaroa, Tafiri Matea, God of Winds and Storms, and atmosphere, and then into the water, it's a different brother. So, it's a, so I did wasn't aware of the refraction, so I missed it and just muddied all the water and we had to go home. But anyway, the part to get is all about abundance. So that's just a brief aside to um, talking about, talking about uh, what these patterns represent. They help you and they modify behavior. You can either have, choose to have uh, self-defeating behavior, self-limiting behavior, which we call noir, or to be common. Or you can have self-modifying uh, behavior, which we call tapu, which is our, which is our value system, the way why we do what we do, getting back to our intention. So um, the greatest platform we have for for what we're doing this platform like this public speaking oratory and the importance of te reo and maori culture is that is the platform to be at that's a place to be with that big head in the sky the one in the ancestral on top of the house if we could have that first shot again please al the, of the outside of the meeting house and you can see that for some of you that are older and around the american culture um that one at the top we would call you know more calling Orson, more calling Orson, come in Orson, the big head up there. Right? But we do that through karakia, through through prayers, which are our energy sources, so that we align with a higher level of engagement. And we also align with the head of our ancestors in that in that house, the Tokamanuyano. And then it comes down to the head who is speaking on the platform right now. So you have all those conduits, you have the conduit or the amurangi. Those armatures on the house that go left and right. Right. They're called Amo, Rangi to the heavens. So you really align at a different level of engagement as you speak on behalf of the people so that your heart, your mind, your sensibilities are all towards that way. Now, this uh, house, Te Tokanga Nuyanoho, comes from our ancestor, Parafete. Uh, and what actually happens is that she, um, she was. Uh, hmm, in a different, she'd uh, gone off with uh, someone else in the, in the relationship and her husband had come to get her. And when he got there, she warned him about, uh, by saying these words, Ya kwe haere mai, i te rau rau te ahaere, te no atu ai, te tōkanga nui ano. Why did you come with a small basket of a traveller rather than staying home at, at the marae? What she was saying was warning him that you're in peril, you're in danger, you're in danger. So as they were doing their exchanges, um, he'd made a plan, and as we were performing the haka, he said, mata, mata, and the smata, mata went out to spread the back of the other guy. Mm. And that's how our, our house got its name. So um, speaking through this really is, um, when you have five quarter, you've got no props. There are no props, there are no images like this. You have to create them visually in people's minds as you speak. So you've virtually got, I heard from the cowboys, you know, just have four chords and the truth. So as I'm going through, I'm using some of the, the different forms and songs and things to share these with you, to, to set a scene, to set a palette, to set a play. You can remove the image now, thank you, uh, Al. And um, as again, for any people listening, you're welcome to ask some more questions. Um, Therapy? I'll give it with one, with one of these, uh, different genres of taking one piece of, of uh, cordial. So this one says, Piki mai, kake mai. I climb, I climb. O mai te wai ora. I'm wanting to get some inspiration. Kia we tu te huan as I'm standing here in front of you, or sitting here in front of you. Ko a te moe a te kui e te pōo, pōo i rauru wai wai raka. Because, um, uh, I'm here and I'm in a place where there's some 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 troubles going on. So I'll just notice that there's a, a question and answer box. Thank you, Simonetta. Um, 
and I just call it up a little bit. Here we go. Would you like me yeah, to, uh, to read that? Uh, no, sure you can. Just, just, just get your, uh, what are we? What, what are we? Of course you can. Bird, kia ora matua bird. Just checking up in the colour care for the session. Is it relevant? I can't keep not going bird. I noticed that each statue in the meeting room has a different expression. Do you have a meaning behind each of them? Yes, they are. There are lots of, they They have a, a whole uh, plethora of different expressions, like you do as you have emotions, you know, you know, all sorts of things. So, of course, they're going to be um, expression now, particular type of thing. I'll come back with that at the end and, and get you with that that question. So, thank you for that. Um, so, four chords in the crew. So, you pick a mic, okay, mic. So, I climb, my climb. I'm waiting for you to kill you two, two, one, a quiet, two, one, a quiet, four, four, you don't know where you so but the crashing tides at Spirit's Bay when people passed when they died at the top of the North Island, you had the Tasman and the Pacific crashing together. As night followed day, there's a new dawn, a new light, a new generation coming through. Kids, 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 kids future proofing. Behave mode, your life must go on. Male injection of life, female nurturing of life, life itself. So, so you can do it like that, you know. You can not show, or you can do it in a, in an orange's way. Or you can do like that. Or you can change the genre into a song like this. <laughs> So you get those different genres that you can get through. Just sharing the words, you can use it as an oration, or you can put it into another song. So, I wanted to talk about the connection between Kororangi, Maitahu, Kahunu, Rongomai, Wahine, Mahinarangi, all these different pillars within the, within the house itself. But I don't think there's, <laughs> there's enough time there. So. We can do that at another time. Needless to say that Pororang and Maitau, Pororang are, are big people on the East Coast. They're the people of my wife. We're living here now. And uh, we connected into the house, in our house, through the love story that they had between Turo, my ancestor, and Mahinarangi, her ancestor. Okay. Um, through that, I just want to close now uh, with a reconnection to you all. Oh, sorry, I need to say another couple of things. Kahungunu is another one of the people in the room of my wahine and Mahinarani. They're all inside that house. All the stories are inside that meeting house. You might want to pull up the interior again, please, Al. Thank you very much. And uh, the, the house was built by a, a, a chief, Te Koti Rikirani, who came from uh, the people here on the coast as well in Gisborne, the room of Akata. And what had happened was that he was on uh, he was on the run from the from the government of the day who wanted him killed. So he stayed with uh, with our people uh, during the eighteen eighty three period and uh, for about ten years. And when he left, he left his house for us as a gift. So I've got to say that. Also for the Tuhoi people, when we had a, a battle, they called Lewi's last stand. Behind me is a photo of my tupuna, Lewi and. Uh, the Ngaituhoi people came across there at the Battle of Orako. Professor Poe Temer has just written a book about that. And uh, I'll put that as some references. It'll be a great read. And also coming back to our Waikato Manyapoto people. So I'd like to close with this, this way out to here. 
And um, it was written by Papa Joe Hoppe, who was a PhD in ethnology and anthropology, but he spent a lot of time in the uh, US and uh, as a jazz musician. So, so he writes a song here. I first saw it at a tangi for one of our tupuna uh, papa, Rewi Pānapa, back in Maniapoto. And the way I was exposed to the Waiata was that one was that the tanga were in the Urupa, the cemetery, and uh, Papa Rewi had been buried and everyone had gone off with some young people singing songs. And this old co this elderly man came along, asked him to pick up the guitar and play a song. And uh, he made it look like a matchstick or such a yes. Anyway, I listened to the song, followed him, and this is yeah. how 25 years in the US, he came back, he still had his language, and he wrote this beautiful song. Look down, Lord, at your people who are crying. Oh, wait, thankfully. so I'd like to finish now. We can clear that uh, picture now, thanks, huh? So I'd like to just finish with a, a reference to uh, a poem I heard recently from Dennis Settlement from the Nakura Valley in BC and the Anthapaskan Stubik's tribe. And his poem was, I hate you residential school. I'll send you a, a flick of that because it really connected with me. And why I say that is connect with you all, right? Connect with you all. In terms of uh, an analogy and an apostrophe, and I'm thinking of when I was a kid, pop culture, Bruce Lee, 1977, Golden Harvest Productions, Enter the Dragon. I'm think, feel. So with that, you can get that now. When I was um, over doing a movie called uh, Moby Dick, we were over there and uh, it was a wonderful experience. I worked with the great Mr. Gregory Peck and Patrick Stewart was there and Henry Thomas, my mate Henry. He was a boy from E.T. Anyway, we did a rendition of that. One of the other Māori there was Apirana Taylor. And while we were there, we had the after, after, after a rap party, right? And we'd agreed to do Kamate Kamate. It was me, Chris Graham from Ngāpuhi, Api from Ngāti Purao on the East Coast, and then me. And we, we went to do uh, the haka. Api, you know this. And we went to do the, the haka Kamate Kamate that we all knew that the All Black uh, Rugby team performed. Matsu Simon going to rugby this afternoon. So I just want to finish with this call little. And um, when we got up to perform it, Api just broke into his own haka from his own people called Ruomokokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonuomokonu
And the best way to do that, once again, rather than um, the intention is the, the, the connectors, rather than talking to about the languages and the culture is to move through the culture and the language. I mean, for me to have to express this entirely in English would be a really difficult job. So I take my hat off to, to uh, Dennis Stellan and his quarter. You must listen to that beautiful name. That will grab me by the heart and rip it out and rip the guts out. So this, this particular um, really, as we call it, it's about survival through disaster and devastation. I want you to, to consider this, right, the violation of your mother, of your sister, of your children and everything else, and then coming through that and yet still surviving as a people. Not only that, but flourishing as a people. So I just want to finish right on that note there. So, uh, and it's an, an, and the intention again is with the connection. It goes like this. Wohioranga mai hoki tato, we te pare kula imana wa toki tu. Tu kaleika o to fan, fa yaka mata popore mai ki te pira u o tafanaunga. Fanaunga mata ki te po, tini o te po, manu o te po, wahana kore kore o te po. Wohi te po, hei te po, hei te o, hei te o. Hei te po, hei te po, hei te o, hei te o. What the fair Hey, Vaka Kote Tamu Tamu, no Vertu Kote Tamu Tamu, no Tao Puhike Kote Tamu Tamu, Ki Mai Nei, Le Huahi Aman Aki Te Kokihi, Oa Oe Mate Te Kokihi, Ki Mai Nei, Le Huatoro Man Aki Te Korolang, Oa Oe Mate Te Korolang, Kuku Tia, Fela 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 Ia, so, the intention, your why, the expression of it, how do you express it? So that we connect. And through that connecting healing and well being. <clears throat> so, guys, I encourage you all, and I look forward to hearing your stories and walking with you in your footsteps. Thank you, Perry. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Very hard to follow this act. Yes. Uh, Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, if I could just uh, jump in with a word, uh, Simonator, and maybe we'll have a few minutes for uh, questions and answers. But I, I just want to say uh, to you, Simon, thanks ever so much for uh, setting the stage as you did today for uh, Peripi's uh, presentation. Uh, what you gave us, Simon, is a really beautiful, cohesive. Uh, encapsulation of a very important history that we all should know more about. And Peripi, I, I cannot thank you enough uh, for this magnificent gift that you've brought uh, to us today and left with us for the rest of our lives. Uh, what a magnificent and generosity of spirit uh, you bring to uh, your, your presentation as an educator, as a poet, as a philosopher, as an artist, as a a genuine and authentic human being. Being in your presence is itself a learning experience for which I am ever grateful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Pirapi, and thank you, Simon. It's really an amazing uh, presentation. Um, there are some uh, remarks in the Q&A, uh, mostly people saying thank you. Um, somebody mentioned the te kupu. Yes. Uh, I, 
Okay. I want to thank you from Stacy Kamihiro, but I can't see any other comments for the dance. If there are some questions you might like to to uh, share them, Simonetta, and I'll do the best I can with Matsu Haimon to answer them. Yes, I would like to invite everyone to post their questions if you have any. Um, as a follow up to my previous one that you picked up, uh, Piripi, regarding the carvings, and uh, I really love the fact that you began this introduction to Maori culture, very difficult thing to do. Uh, you did it beautifully um, with, with a meeting house. So there is a space where people come together and inhabit, right? That's, that's symbolically very powerful. And um, from the depth of my ignorance of this kind of space, I wonder if you could say more about how does this coming together happen? Is there <laughs> somebody who allows certain things to happen in the house? Is there a keeper of the house? Who is this person? <laughs> it's interesting. I'm, I'm smiling because we had an international delegation of people from Silicon Valley. And uh, we were taken into another meeting house. And they were kind of around me of um, young frat kids that had run into a lot of money and sharing ideas around the world, good on them. So they all jumped in the van and we took them down to the house. And they said, oh, how should we behave here? Angela, no sex, no drugs, no alcohol. <laughs> and just like, stay between the eyes. Um, having said that, um, at this time, and I've uh, mentioned it before, but I'd like to formally invite both you and George to come and sleep in our house and to eat at our at our place and to walk through with you to, to tell you and share with you exactly what those mean. So, and then the, 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 there's another house I'd like to share with you because there's something cooking in um, like George and, and Matua Haimana sitting there looking at the stars. I'm sitting there looking at the stars and what potentially could be in terms of the relationship for IDSVA taking it to another virtual level, the algorithms. What you're looking at in those statues are algorithms, actually. They're the, they're the metaphysical algorithms of the universe. They tell our stories, your stories, their stories, and potentially other stories as we go through. So I can just think of being a kid there. So I go up, yay, lots of food, lots of family, and I can eat and play and play rugby on the, on the place where you're meant to do speeches and told not to play rugby on the place where you're meant to do speeches. <clears throat> Hanging on to my nanny's skirts and hearing all the old people doing those things and hearing all the old men doing their things and just waiting for our turn to go and get some more lollies or whatever happened to be, right? So in the meeting houses, what you have is you have, um, you just go and sleep there. <laughs> you know, you go and do your business, you go and sleep there, you go and eat there. It could be a 21st birthday, a wedding, funerals. The funerals are the most, the biggest deal. They take prisons over anything else. I was there as a, um, as the M, as a MC when we were had our Waitangi tribunal here in Smato Haimuna to settle the um, the grievances that we had with the Crown. That was recently settled, and uh, I was like the the Mahatma Gandhi guy between the the home people and and the and the Crown. So I'll just share this brief anecdote. We had the Crown uh, solicitor and a Crown historian, both essentially telling lies because that, that was their job. They were paid by the Crown to tell lies. Um, and uh, at the end of it, I was asked to close up. <clears throat> and I said, oh, listen, before I close up, Your Honor, um, late Judge Ambler, uh, I just got to share something with you, right? Um, there's a kui out there, my auntie, because just before it closed, my, one of my favorite auntie, Roy Mata, Wee Paki, he passes me a note and says, get a koha from these guys. Lucky the marae cat has been hit by a car. And get all these girls want to get out of there, all these people want to get important people, and she wants me to get a, a collection for her cats. <clears throat> now, auntie, she, um, she loves cats. I can attest to this, because when Angela and I got married at the meeting house, I'm standing there in my rooms, stuff with my, you know, my cloak, my personal cloak with feathers and everything. All Angela's people from Naitahu and Ngātipuro Kahuna down at the gate, and I'm nervous, nervous, nervous going, intended. 
<clears throat> just before my auntie does the call, she looks at me and says, boy, I'm going home to feed the cats. And she did. <laughs> so I go back and try and tell a few stories about the house. Anyway, she wanted me to collect the score home. So don't excuse me, Judge, before I close up, I just wanted to say that um, it's my favorite auntie there, and she says that luckily the one I kept was hit by a car. And I have it on good authority, that was your, your car, Judge. <laughs> I'm just telling the story, right? But anyway, um, there were two things that happened there. One is that when non Māori want to look into the Māori world, and they want to say, what's the, dif what's the difference? The difference really, and it was told to me by Praere Huata, one of the relatives of the family that uh, Matuhaimana connected to, he said that when I was working at Waikiri Prison running the dang thing, 950 prisoners, 450 staff, he says, Philippi, why are you here? Problem. He said, so why are you really here? Is that sort of guy. So he described that like this mainstream, and I've shared this with Matua George, Relationships are uh, determined by technical, rational, or scientific approach that identifies performance uh, relationships to performance or behavior. So that's finite and singular. Whereas tell Māori, the Māori worldview is a participating consciousness of awareness that identifies relationships to each other. And that's collective and enduring, which is what we're doing right now. We're relating to each other, we're connecting, and we're hoping that these things, as you're taught, those many years ago, Matua George, we're connecting, and now they're enduring, and now they're collective. It wasn't just so you and Matua Haimon and they could just, you know, rub shoulders and be the good old boys. It was something that grew out of this idea. And so when I finished that, I was pretty pleased with myself. But then I had another aunt who was really annoyed because she had actually place a bunch of fucking papa these genealogy notes on the judge's table because he believed the lawyers and all the judges and historians got it wrong. And at lunchtime she hit me up and said, boy, what, what, what's, what's the matter with these guys? Because you're smoking away there. But what had happened was that um, the, the bailiff, even though we were in a meeting house, a traditional one, the system was Pākehā, was Western. We're really clear about that. And she was really annoyed because the bailiff said, we can't see these. What's the matter with them? Right for the bloody eyes, but why can't they see them much well, right? They had to go through due process. So I stood up and said, that's my auntie. I've been scared of it since I was a kid, still scared of her. <clears throat> and her name is. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the judge said, thank you. I'll see her after this. See in process. Then we, oh, and I said, by the way, so auntie loves, loves cats, so there's going to be a koha going around. We don't take plastic. I don't know what your level is like, but put some money in for the cat. So then uh, that went around, and then I said one last thing. I spoke about this this other auntie, because the women run the world in Tel Aviv. You can hear me, my people. You know this is true, right? So when uh, when he said I'll speak to her after this, that connected that bit there. So then I went to close down, and as we were closing, we'd heard that they I got through the I was speaking in Maori. There were translators there from the Maori Language Commission. That place that said I'm, I can translate, right? And um, it said that the uh, the Crown Solicitor's, solicitor's mother had died. So I heard that and stopped the proceedings and got all the people to, to stand to Karaki and pray for his mum. And we sang a song. Uh, just to get the tune about the Sikilmetalist, right? A whole Marae full of Maori people. Um, um, The, the, the Māori battalion sang. My whole place was saying. So this um, solicitor who could hear it, he could hear, see his eyes wiggling because all of a sudden you know, the Philistines turned into Gentiles singing for his mum. That's why it wasn't. And then we closed up after that. So again, it's reconnecting connectivity to the people. There might be the, the, the foreign affairs, but when we hear something like that, we can connect to their hearts and their grief. And there's, a, there's another epilogue that follows that. So birthdays, those sorts of things. Um, having a meeting about uh, our local business that needs to be taken care of. 
and and more often than not, unfortunately, funerals. Funerals are a big deal for us. We 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 make a big deal, three four days about them. And the thing is, it's it's um, it's definitely pathos, but it's also warmth because it reconnects us at our best levels. And often Māori is saying, "Gee, we must meet and then when it's Māori tangi." And uh, so that's it. I've taken a little bit longer to explain that to you, Maneta, but I hope it's adequate. Thank you, Perepi. Thank you, Perepi. I wonder if Simonetra, if I could jump in with a question for Perepi. Please, please do. You know, I'm wearing a karoo that uh, Simon uh, gave to me as a as a very precious gift, maybe a decade ago or so. And I I know that you are wearing something very similar, uh, Perepi. And I know that Simon very often wears his. Maybe you could yes, there you go, Simon. Uh, maybe you could say something, Perepi, about the significance of the karoo for the people that are joining us today and see us wearing this karoo as a, a tree or right. right. shared spirits. Yeah. Matuhamon, can I just have a look at yours? Can you pull it up to the screen so I can see what you've got on? Okay, cool. So yeah, you can tell that you guys are in and stimpy, you are you joined together at the hip. So that kōru, that kōru design is about growth. It's about growth and propagation. And if you look on the Air New Zealand branding, <laughs> branding of intellectual and cultural property, and you see there that it really is a reflection of the flora and fauna in Aotearoa New Zealand here. You find them everywhere. It's classic. Just look everywhere. There's a cordon, right? Like if you're saying Times Square, you look everywhere. There's a billboard like this one in Aotearoa. It's a cordon, and the cordon again is a symbol of growth, development, fruition, propagation. All of those good things. All of those good things. And because it's in Ponama, which is the most important type of of um, this is our kind of like gold and platinum thing. You know, if you put something gold there and you put something for, for a Māori and like this, the gold gets ditched <laughs> immediately. Right? It reminded me, I had a bit of a, we moved up from down south and we had a couple of, we had a, a place in Wellington and one in Christchurch as well. And when we got here, we doubled up with a whole lot of things. <laughs> and uh, so we were giving away double ups. You know? Whatever you do, people do not store things because when you go back to the store to yesterday's news, we had double ups. <laughs> So I had this dilemma. We either had the silverware or these um, less expensive ones with Māori patterns on. And uh, I'll tell Jordan Simonetta later what, what I did, the one I chose. But, you know, it was quite a, <laughs> quite a shout out. So again, yeah, the cordon is about, it's about uh, not only growth and development and propagation, but also protection. Protection, the participation in the regeneration of other other, uh, you know, growing fronds or people in ID SVA who, who then become doctors, right? And the growth of that, the participation, and then also the, um, the protection of that. So they, they're very, very apt. I'm one of those that in his legal realm. It doesn't as people are much of you doing the educational field. You, you, you do it in, in, in picking up that mantle. Right. So they're each and every one of these. My one here, uh, my wife got it. It's interesting. Our people, money are We're fighters of the new skillet. Right? And her people are, are, are gentle people. They go with um, hair, hingakara, with loving hearts. So you've got, uh, if you like, a meeting of Mahatma Gandhi and Genghis Khan. And that's nice. And that's again with that manatani, manawahine. So, so this thing here has been really beautiful. I used to have one that was a toki, which is a, an attacker's weapon. Right? And then I noticed over the years that I've been softened. So can I say just one recommendation, which mm -hmm. is the 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 marae, the Faranui therapy that you explained so beautifully. Um, for those in the United States and those visiting the United States, I would highly recommend going to the Field Museum in Chicago, where the uh, Rua Tepu Puke Tu, the 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 Faranui, the meeting house that is originally from Tokumaru Bay, where Pirapi is now, was eventually ended up at this museum. 
and a huge room is dedicated to it and it has the original painting On the on the on the mahi on the budge and when you go into it the presence of this um meeting house is overwhelming and so if you're in chicago or if you're in the states and you're intending to go somewhere where perhaps one of the only uh, other than in wellington and and with better peace the only faranui that has so much of the original features and has with so much of the spirituality, the wairua of 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 the original uh, building uh, is is to be experienced and to to be respected. And that appreciate it. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, sir. I just want to respond, if I can, please, to Anna. Mm -hmm. ideas. Yes. So. Uh, Yes, hola, hola. Uh, hola uh, let's uh, read the question because I don't think the audience will see the question. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, she said, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, please. Oh, she said the chant at the end seems to be a warrior chant. Is it given to Maori warriors in ceremony or dream? It seems to speak directly to the heart as a ikaro. A ceremonial chant from the Amazon. Wow. I'll say the year. It's nice to see years. So there was a there was a, a battle at um at a place at Manawatoki to where the heart was cut into pieces. And uh the person that was there came back and you could say that it came through in a dream because we didn't have any written written uh, forms of writing other than what you see when we would have be uh, meeting house literate. So you can walk through the meeting house and it's like having your your algorithm. Then you push play and out comes your uh, AI, right? So she would have had that and then already sent that down and through the generations it's lasted. And despite this putting a suppression act and such, yeah, it, it's lasted through the nails of time and and the savagery of, of colonization and white supremacy so that it's come and it's stayed there. So thank you for that question, my sister. Uh, again, it is definitely a warrior's challenge. I mean, I don't know if you can see that. That's the whole idea of rather than talking about the culture, but sharing with you. Oh, no, 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 no. You just, you know, you can help, you know, you fire up on that. So yes, it is. So to get directly to your response, it is a chant given not only to warrior men, but warrior women. Right, Amazonian women, <laughs> right, and uh, and it does come through the dreams. I spoke earlier on about in the same in the same way that Simon, Matua Simon and Matua George had that dream, te pua waitango te whakaura, that eternal creation, and then through that thought and fruition, who would have known that it would lead to many, many, many platforms and speakers and voices and presence like this? So, uh, yes, um. Gracias, mi compañera. Ahora siempre pensaremos en la pueblo de, de Amazon. So with Deborah, the intention, the integrity, the connection, you walk your talk. Oh, thank you. You should write an article about these three values that great growth and development. Thank you. Well, thank you, Deborah. I'll speak to my um, social marketing area and uh, much with Simon. We'll, we'll follow through with the written work. He's our, he's our master at uh, what we call high-level dishwashing. So I'll have a talk with him and perhaps write an article on Thank you. And he just, I, I prefer to play rugby. So thank you for that. Dumoneta. Great. Uh, well, we are at the 90 minutes. I wonder, there is one final question perhaps um, uh, that our Angela Lynn put out there. Uh, she says, on April 20th, you will see a solar eclipse in New Zealand in the morning. I have been wondering if there is a significance of eclipse in relation to the earth and sky references you made earlier. That would take another 90 minutes. <laughs> oh, I'm serious. It would we take another 90 minutes. <laughs> All I can say is this, that Māori will create narratives and stories. Each of those whakapapa lines I gave, each of those names that go down, you know, could be a paddy, it's fine, it's fine, it's paddy. Each of those has its own narrative. 
And I, each of those decisions has its own narratives. And I would encourage, I encourage my mom, my kids and all of them to write in the first person, the first thing I remember growing up is. And that's what the letter to my 10 year old self was, Simonetta. It was something so that my kids could read that and walk through the shoes of their pa. Because they went from being what we affectionately call pa rats to living in white privilege. Because someone crossed the pathway. But you've got to remember where you come from, humble beginning to noble outcomes. So, and coming back to that that story there, and and what you were saying about the eclipse, uh, thank you, Alan, for that question. So, if I look at the eclipse, we see Tamanui Tera as a young man at its zenith, like uh, Matua George and Matua Haimon when they were working at the uh, the rusty scupper, very rusty, very scuppery, right, and very young. Find up and phenomenally focus on their fantastic fun fill for Kapapa Fai Kordero and financial futures and brokers of gunk, right? But they had dreams. So there they were at the West Coast. And so when you see the sun at its zenith, that represents a young male youth. And that's where the haka comes from because when the sun comes down and hits the, the, the earth in the, in the summer, the heat rays come up. We say that the the sun had two wives, the winter maiden and the summer maiden, it was from the summer maiden with those fire that the you get the wedding, and that's the god of the haka. So that's a sun and it's in. Then you have Mahina, the earth maiden, Phoebe in Greek culture. I used to teach um, classical studies one time. Any studies one time. Anyway, you've got the, the moon maiden, right? And she's there. And believe it or not, in our culture, there comes a time you've got, you've got. I'm going to put mother, mother, nanny in the middle of the, the sun and the moon. And in that meeting, I said, boy, you sleep there. Girl, you sleep here. I'm in the middle. <laughs> so you don't, you know, when you're young, you've got, you're just a kid with adult bits, right? So you've got nanny in the middle. Then nanny goes to sleep and <laughs> you get a bit of a clink of the old eye and <laughs> like this. So I'm reminded of an old movie called uh, Lady Hawk with Rutger Howe and uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. And in that, in the movie, they they were to change into a wolf and a, and a, and a hawk, and at the just at the touch of the dawn, they saw each other for a little bit, and disappeared. So for us, when you have those cycles, every now and then there's eclipse and eclipse, where the sun and the moon come together, and the moon devours the sun, and then she shines. Now there's a whole lot of other depth in that story that we can go to a wee bit later, but you'd have to. Be over 18 for me to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you a wonderful answer. Thank we you. might qualify for that, much, uh, George. <laughs> yes. Thank you for me. And uh, maybe that's a wonderful way to uh, say good night. But again, to say most of all, uh, first of all, to uh, thank you to the people who have joined us tonight. And most of all, of course, to Simon and Peripi for this magnificent gift, this beautiful, beautiful bequeath that leaves us ever enriched and ever indebted to your generosity. Thank you, Mata. Thank you, everybody. Mauri ora. Mauri ora. Matewa. Matewa. Thank you. Good stuff. <laughs>